So good morning, everybody, and I hope that you had a fantastic uh, time in your first or second or zero night in, in Berlin last night. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we certainly did, and uh, we would like to thank you and welcome you here to the uh, GCCM uh, Berlin. And uh, we're going to talk about a very, very nice topic, and I have to look at it. It's called Networks as a Platform. So we have to rethink, rethink the, uh, the network business models for our digital future. And uh, I know it's a mouthful, but I'm so happy that I have uh, the expert sitting next to me and in the room. So um, I will give them quickly a minute to introduce himself. Hein, maybe if I may ask you. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. So I'm Hein, um, working for Xperio. We'll explain the company a little bit later on, but I'm responsible for the products on SASE, SD-WAN and security. Thank you, Hein, and thank you for sponsoring this session. Really appreciate it. You're up next. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my name is Andreas Bandel. I'm the area director for DACH and the Eastern Europe region um, for Cato Networks. And Cato Networks is a um, or the first um, cloud native um, SASE platform provider. Thank you. Jeremy. Hello, everyone. I'm Jeremy Villalobos. I'm the chief operating officer for GoConnect. Uh, we basically are known for our LATAM Connect platform, which we built uh, in the last four years. And we have an algorithm that allows us to do feasibility analysis on the, on the last miles in the different countries. So I'm happy to be here. And happy to have you here because I know it was a long flight. And uh, <laughs> when your son calls you, uh, he thinks at 10 a.m. in the morning and it's 4 a.m. your time then, right? <laughs> yeah. But fantastic that you could make it. Thank you. And uh, Branislav. Yeah. Hi, my name is Branislav Politanovic. I'm from Deutsche Telekom. Uh, I'm a sales engagement manager. And my main topics is SD1, uh, vendor comparison, SASE comparison, and to put that in a digitized way so that you have a nice and neat tools, how salespeople can compare them, these solutions and find the best fit for it. Okay, thank you. We're going to hear later more from you from your presentation after the presentation from Hein from Experio. Okay. And Roy, last but not least, my friend. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. All right. I'm uh, Roy Chua. I'm principal at Everthink, a research and analysis firm in infrastructure technology. Uh, we used to be part of SDX Central, which I co-founded in 2012, spun up in 2018. Uh, we focus on cloud virtualization and software-defined infrastructure, and we tend to work a lot with uh, T1 carriers, hyperscalers, and a lot of uh, infrastructure technology vendors. Glad to be here. Thank you and cool being with us, uh, Roy. And I know, 1 a.m. at your time, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 it is, but uh, it's not that bad. Thank you so much for joining. So, uh, Haim, um, I think you have a, a story to tell <coughs> and you want to share something with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. So if I may invite you, please, to the start. stand. Thank you so much. Works. Of course it will work. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It's a bit, a bit of hot in here. I hope it's not from the drinks. I think it was the air corner work. And, uh, I'm ready for it. So uh, I enjoyed it a lot yesterday. Hope you did as well. And thanks again to the friends of IPB for hosting us at their magnificent venue. Really love it. Hope you had a good shot of caffeine to be a <laughs> part of that second day. Uh, let's give it a, give it a kickstart. Uh, I kind of like the, the topic here, network as a platform. Although I want to give it a little twist and call it a network as part of a platform. How that come, we'll get to that later on. It's definitely not gonna be a sales presentation about who is Xperio, how fancy we are, and how good we are. Absolutely not. I just wanna guide you a little bit through the journey of, um, yeah, how is an enterprise changing? What is digital transformation bringing to the network? And yeah, how to solve that? And at the end, it's gonna be a little bit about Xperio, how the platform is actually delivering more value or an easier way of experiencing the whole digital transformation. As long as you say that it's a Dutch company. Yeah? It's, uh... Absolutely, Dutch company. <laughs> <laughs> it's really global. It's Dutch colored here somehow. Max. <laughs> so, we heard it yesterday with Eon. So I'm going to reference every now and then to Eon because it was kind of funny. I built my, my presentation uh, last week and then um, still came up yesterday and it actually matches pretty well. So, yeah, nice reference to it. So 
just meaning that what I'm telling is not yes or literally happening today with any time. So what we've seen and what we've heard yesterday is that a lot of enterprises are on that digital transformation journey. And what we try to understand is what effect does that have, does that have on the network? And we'll see right here with a nice, the nice slider. I mean, the first takeaway or the first item coming up with the digital transformation is the cloud adoption. We'll talk about it. There's a lot of cloud being involved. With the pandemic recently, it was just like an accelerator, a catalyst to get quicker to the cloud, quicker, quicker than ever before. Now, just some numbers, really I don't like slides, it's just backing up my story again. So uh, what you see is it's happening right now, right? Digital transformation and the cloud adoption, it's not yesterday, it's not tomorrow, it's right now, it's happening right now. Okay, cool. Fast. And what, what effect does that have on the network? Back in the days when we had MPLS, I know still some companies have MPLS, but MPLS was good to give quality to the applications they had at that specific moment. We went to a data center back and forth, a bit of communication amongst one another, but that's basically it and easy to control. Now with that cloud adoption, the whole pattern of using applications is kind of changing, right? It's kind of changing and we actually need to make a step up. No longer look at the transport itself, but look at the layer seven, that what is happening at that application. How can I make sure that all my different applications, that they are being served well, and that actually the end user is being satisfied with the quality we bring for that application. So it's a step up. It's not looking at the green lights of my, my underlay, my, my infrastructure. It's a step up. It's looking at the experience from an application. Point of view. And that's actually where SD-WAN kicks in. Right? Again, it's happening today. Look at the stats, it's happening today. And it's already pretty much mature. And right? I think SD-WAN kicked, kicked off, what is it, 2013, 14, 15? Went through maturity stage. And I think now nowadays it's pretty much well adopted and we're getting to a to a next phase which i will uh, hint on later on but it's pretty mature and uh, if you look at sd one what it brings it's actually bringing the application as fast as possible as good as possible to the end user because that's what sd one is designed for it's actually designed for cloud native business next to that i mean sd one is fancy it's cool but it's not a magic not a magic stick right it needs something which brings the traffic from a to b and that's something is the right one, it's the connectivity barrier. It's no longer going to the data center and breaking out there. No, it's immediately on the spot. And I think Phil said it as well, 85% of his traffic of Eon is traversing through the internet, 85%. And a whole freaking big thing of it is Microsoft Teams, right? Really difficult to control, really difficult to give the quality for the end user. Again, here, SD-WAN and internet, they come hand in hand. We see, you might say, hmm, only 40% by 2025, but it's 40% of the enterprises who are using internet only. Internet only as the bearer for the business critical applications. But with that changing pattern, with the changing pattern of breaking out locally, we're getting to a, let's say, a second or a third wave of complexity. We have the cloud adoption, we have SD WAN, we have the underlay. What about security? A whole bunch of my traffic is breaking out locally. I need to have something to control that. Again, back in the days, it went up to a data center or to a central gateway, put some big machines in there, which control the traffic, big firewalls, which are super cool, super fancy. But today that doesn't work anymore. It needs to happen at where yet the end user is residing, be it a mobile end user, be it uh, an office itself, a corporate office. It needs to happen where it's being consumed. And that's the fact, or that's the leveraging point of the internet locally but also the leveraging point of new types of security, call it sexy, call it cloud-based security, call it SSE, doesn't matter. It's just, for me, another level of complexity for a customer to manage this whole state. Yeah, the stats, they show it, that sexy security, cloud security, I mean, that's the next thing to, to worry about, I and mean, worry is a big word, but the next thing of complexity to actually uh, put into your whole, uh, your whole landscape. I mean, the story is there, right? The story of complexity is there. You have cloud adoption, you have SD-WAN, internet, security. All of that needs to be brought together. And when we talk to customers, they say, I don't care. I don't care about what component is in there. The only thing that matters for me is my end user experience, and especially for my business critical applications. So what they say is, get me something which is bringing that experience to my customer. Get me something. Is it one platform? Is it multiple different technologies? Get me something which is bringing that end user experience. And that's actually my very last slide, it's probably a bit longer slide and a bit of a, 
on sales sales pitch, but the idea of the or the vision uh, Xperia has and is firmly building on it's that intelligent platform. So what we bring again is the combination of multiple different technologies. Simply think about the underlay, right? How how complex is that? One company has multiple different locations, remote users, and every location has specific needs. With these specific needs, I mean, one could do with a simple broadband because it's a sort of a sales office. Another one needs to be super resilient, right? Diverse parts, what have you. If you want to do that yourself, it's kind of a kind of a job to figure that out. That's something we've put in our, we call it intelligent platform, Xperia one. It's actually from the ground on built to have that intelligence in itself. Just to give you an example, the customer, they can simply log on to their portal and have a look. That's my location. What availabilities do I have there? From broadband all the way down to super fiber, super diversified. Right? So it's actually at the fingertips to have a look. What do we have there? That's only one component. It's only one component because Xperia.1 is a technology agnostic component or a technology agnostic platform, meaning if a customer has underlay with us and only one SASE technology or an SD WAN and an on prem firewall and a bit of cloud security, everything is going to be embedded, embedded in that single platform to have that one single experience. It's just clicking what is my global estate, what is my estate at a single site, what is my estate for a single user, and just yeah, it's at the fingertips, that easy. Um, and in the end, we manage it for them, obviously. And I think uh, being agnostic, giving that intelligence to a platform, for me, that's, that's the next way to go. And that's actually the, the company's vision, the company's mission, being an intelligent platform. And if I then rephrase that to the very initial question, what effect does a digital transformation has on the network? I mean, the network together with the platform, for us, for me, it's simply an enabler of that whole digital transformation. All right. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Hein. Is there some some questions for Hein? Maybe from the Dutch part. I see a lot of <laughs> nice t-shirts. No. Hein, congratulations! Yeah. You have been clip and clear. Clip and clear. <laughs> no question. In the time frame as well. From, fantastic. Sort of. As always. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to listen to Branislav from, uh, from Deutsche Telekom. And uh, Branislav, you will uh, talk about what today? What's, uh, what's your topic today? We'll see what's on the slide. You know, it's, it's <laughs> transparency karaoke. So. You know, th th that's the beauty of working for a large operator. I've been there as well on the French side. He's on the German side. You know, you just ask your marketing to prepare it for you. No, that's not true. I, no? I did it by myself. It, oh, <laughs> fantastic. Even better. No, is um, good morning. You just said good morning and, and welcome everybody. Uh, I was talking to Hein up front, you know, we were thinking about how can we uh, give the most benefit to you and he closed, you know, with the evolution and um, how networks are changing, right? And we know that um, everything in life is becoming more and more complicated, right? And everything is evolving to something. And when we talk about the network, and evolution, what makes more sense than um, yeah, this works, that makes most sense, is that you take a look at the timeline, you know, about networks and how networks have evolved. The first thing is in 1999, we have MPLS and that, ah, uh, here, I see Alessandro is a fan of that. That's very good. It's uh, still a good technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's a good technology, you know, for the purpose that it was meant. And then when we take further look and see what happened, 2002, AWS was announced, Azure came 2008, then we have 0365, 2011. Do you figure out something? The network didn't change. Didn't change. You know, so what, what is about the evolution? In 2015, SD1 came. So we're really totally behind the time in the network. And that's the reason when we go on 2015, then 2016, we have SDX, you know, so having everything through a software, you know, let it sink in, you know, MPLS was brutally just, we have some lines connected, super complex, that's okay. But if central internet break out, you know, and then, then you access something, everything is going through this bottleneck, you know, then of course, if you have, bring software into play, it is naturally that you go to SDX, you know, say, okay, we want everything driven by software. 2018, we have network as a service, you know, what's that? You know, again, I have a network as a service, you know, 
I'll come to that in a moment. Then 2019, SASE, and I still omitted some things like SSE and whatever. But you see, only when you look at this timeline, why do we have such a high intensity of changing things? And that is, of course, the digital transformation, the need for new things. You know, 10 or 15 years ago, we did not have MS Teams, WebEx, or whatever, right? But it's natural that we use these tools nowadays. So let's sort and categorize these words, you know, because I'm always confused, you know, you just hear a new word and what does that mean? You know, I mentioned it as the one, what is the network, which is driven by software, you know, so software is the key. Imagine, you know, we have just line, line somewhere connecting, you know, I talked to colleagues who were 30 years in the, uh, in the industry and they said, yeah, I, I started with token rings, you know, so very nice. Yeah, it is like that, you know, but software is the enable nowadays. And what does that mean? It's like, you know, the good old phones, Nokia and the iPhone. I think nobody in, his room, in this room is using or brought a still a Nokia with buttons. But it was nice, right? I mean, I found one in the attic, still battery there, right? So it's, it's I know cool. one. Yeah? So yeah, the Dutch prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I mean, that, that's very good, you know? So uh, it's the same, right? So that there is no argumentation not to use that, you know? What is network as a service? It's a commercial model, you know? And what does that mean? I like this, you know, I, I like comparing things, you know? And I, I took this from a web page about a mobile provider where you can go and you see the sliders there and you just adjust your personal need. So, but what is the fun fact about network as a service? It is a service, you can change it every time, any time. So it's not, I take the slicer, and I say, I want this, and then it remains for years like that because the contract is, is like this. No, it is, you can change it. You can switch things on, you switch things off, like you want, when you want, and you get it. That's a total change, right? It, it is not fixed. You're set up in a network. You can get new features or switch off old, old ones. What is SDX? It's a platform, let's say it like that. So it's not a commercial model. It's a platform where the idea is Everything is there and you just configure like your car, right? You have a configure and you say, I want this, 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 that. Okay, that's the price, go for it. And further on, you have your dashboards where you configure uh, everything in there. That's great. What is SASE? I, I love the idea behind that. Yesterday I said it, you know, it's the first time that we have a convergent view about network and security. And I, I told you yesterday, imagine a car without an airbag, seatbelt, and whatever. You know, you can't imagine that, but that's basically when we talk about SD1, it does not come with security, you know, by design. No, it's not there. You know, it's by accident there, but not by purpose it will be the, by design. And SASE makes it compulsory that you have security in there. So that's like the seatbelt we have had. So one more thing I would like to talk, you know, when we see the evolution here and we have network as a service or network as a platform, it brings us new capabilities. And as I said, when you have a contract about two, three, five years, that I also see it at the market, then the, the question is, okay, how, when I have such a lengthy contract, can I get the most recent new features, you know? And, and I want to talk to you about one feature, and this is artificial intelligence, you know? It's a buzzword, etc. And I was also working uh, for years as data scientist, and, you know, I quit that. Why? Because they, they, they hire me. Yeah, you will change everything, Ronnie. That's great. You know? And I say, where is the data? What do you mean by data? Yeah, to make artificial intelligence in data. Uh, you know, make your own data. What? You know, so that's not possible, right? So that's the nice thing about networks. Every package is a data form. You know, and with every package, you can analyze something. And that's the reason why uh, you can be sure on that. AI is the next big thing. Not that you make millions, no. It will solve your problems, you know? And what kind of problems are these? You know, before we come to that, what is AI in general? And that's a sentence I want that you keep in mind, you know? AI, or artificial intelligence, is just mimicking human behavior. Remind the chatbot. You ask a question, somebody is replying to you, and you get the impression a human being is sitting in front of you. That's mimicking. Human behavior, that's the art of artificial intelligence that you don't see is the difference. I mean, by the way, how you can screw that up is, of course, ask the chatbot ethical questions. Oh, what do you think about the Ukrainian crisis? 
Uh, I don't know what do you mean as the reply because they cannot decide by themselves in the sense of having an opinion. So um, how does it help us? Why I'm saying it's the next big thing. When you take the seat of an error uh, administrator, what does such a person do every day? You have onboarding of devices. You have anomalies which you have to, to find, root cause analysis to see, okay, why is my network not working like it should? Prediction of blackouts. I mean, how or what kind of an administrator can predict a blackout? You know, that, that, that's not an easy way. And many more things. So, all words, I give you an example, a specific one. This comes, um, is an example from Cisco, what they've done. You see here a diagram where you see the onboarding of devices. So that means take the Marriott here. Everybody of you is connected to the Wi-Fi. And this is a Wi-Fi example. So you enter Marriott and your device is automatically connected to the Wi-Fi. What they know by experience, day by day experience, is that some of the devices will fail when they get connected to the Wi-Fi. So you see here, the green band, this is the expected failures, where you know this is the amount of devices which will not make it because they have not the true authentication, they other reasons, you know, blacklisted or whatever. So, and you see that the blue line, which is the, the actual line, shows a deviation of that what you predict. And now your network administrator would start to analyze why is this happening, right? So. And here comes AI into, into play. I show you now three diagrams which uh, show different types. At the top, you see DHCP timeouts, you see authentication failures, and you see blacklisting at the bottom. They have different structures. And when you take a closer look, and I will show it to you, it has a pretty similar behavior to the DHCP problem you will see. So my question is to you, when something is so obvious, why should your network administrator search for hours to find something like that? It does not make sense. That's the capability, one example of AI, that it automatically, automatically scans the data, recognizes the pattern, and solves, solves by itself the problem. And it goes that far, I mean, we do not have so much time. It solves even problems wherever the Juniper, that they have the Marvel system where you can search and ask the system. So you ask, what are the devices which most fail on something? And the artificial intelligence from the semantic search is able to recognize what are you asking for? And it gives you not only the example or the answer, it gives you a diagram of exactly what you searched and you see what is happening, what MAC addresses have failed, what kind of operating systems or devices are rejected, you know? So nice things. So it accelerates and solves a lot of your problems. And to conclude, you know, life is complicated, but the network era was never so calm like now. So let's shape it together, together like Rico yesterday said, you know, let's partner, let's talk about the things because the things are getting complicated and not only one person can solve it or one vendor or one customer, it's just teamwork all over so that everybody is satisfied and we have the best user experience for everybody because the vendors learn from the customers and the customers get the best benefit for their employees. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well done. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Yeah, you're welcome. No, it's okay, it's okay. Any questions? Again, congratulations. Everybody understood exactly with the energy you have. Or they fell asleep. <laughs> but they had coffee, so come on. <laughs> Very good. Very good. So, guys, uh, talking about uh, network as a platform and rethinking actually the network business models for the digital future. Okay, so so let's let's start somewhere. And uh, and uh, uh, maybe Andreas, I can I, I can, can start with you. Can, can you give us a little bit of an, an overview? Well, what are we talking about? Digital transformation for for enterprises. What landscape? What, 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 What's the trend? What do you see out there? So uh, I, I've been working the last 15 years for SaaS providers, cloud um, uh, service providers. And back then it started with specific applications, which you used just as a SaaS service. Um, then um, it started with putting more and more computing power, which you had in your data center, into the cloud data centers. 
um, I think partly it's true that um, we are in the middle of um, digital transformation, um, but I think there's still a way to go. So if you look at how many um, customers today have, for example, their SAP systems in the cloud, it's a minor part, right? Um, so business critical applications so far haven't been fully moved to the cloud. So this is one of the drivers um, for digital transformation. The other thing is when we look into now every device is connected, IoT, right? So this is um, increasing the attack surface as well. So more and more digital, digitalization also means more attack surface. This is the other thing. And we already talked about yesterday in the panel um, about it. So the attackers, they also become more sophisticated. And um, essentially, if you look five years back, um, many companies said, I'm not a target, right? So um, why should a comp an attacker, for example, um, attack a small SMB business? There was no reason for it. And then something happened. And essentially what happened was the leakage of um, nation state tools. So it, it began with um, Snowden and stuff like that. So um, nation state tools have been leaked. They have been available to the um, yeah, like script kiddies and everything. And then it began that um, yeah, there, there was a, suddenly a whole industry focusing on ransomware, right? So now um, everybody is a target. And these are the drivers for digital transformation um, from my perspective. Um, which relates to the network, but as well for security. And we already talked about yesterday um, about it. So we, we need to make sure, and this is also something which is Gartner saying, um, network and security is converging, because if you still have this siloed view on network and security, those attackers, they know exactly where the silos are, mm -hmm. and they use that for their benefit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Roy, you're still with us? I haven't fell asleep yet. <clears throat> Not quite yet. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. well, what trends do you see in the within the whole digital transformation and uh, especially on the enterprise side? What, 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 what do you see? Yeah. So um, what when in our work with enterprises and the uh, cloud providers as well as the tier one telcos, I think what we see is the uh, the adoption of a, a lot of new services that are cloud based. The move of manual <laughs> processes into automated and digital processes. And so there's, there's a lot of uh, use of analytics, uh, use of um, uh, AI and ML to try to improve the business processes that, that exist today and to make sense of the data that's being generated. So that's generally the case. Um, and, and unfortunately, I think, you know, as Andreas pointed out, it's, uh, you know, as you're digitally transforming, it means you're becoming more likely a victim of attack, right? So if you're fully digitally transformed, that, that means that, you know, ransomware means a lot to you because that means the impact on your enterprise um, is greater if you're attacked. But, but fundamentally, a lot of it is about taking the business processes and moving them into digital elements <laughs> and finding value in capturing the data and then transforming the data into something that's consumable by, by the businesses in general. Okay, thank you. Well, gentlemen, while 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 while, while setting the pace and 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 um, and uh, putting down where we uh, as a, as a starting point, let's move into a little bit of the of the network as a service, if you don't mind. Um, I mean, the path towards the network as a service. I mean, you know, um, can we achieve a fully cloud enabled network um, um, with a usage based uh, consumption model? Maybe he has one <laughs> to give him some oh, space, right. <laughs> yeah, if it's okay. Uh, I want to give you the second one, <laughs> because you have one, something to say on this one. Absolutely. Yeah, no, Network as a Service is, uh, is, is, being, is getting popular, you know, with especially uh, with connectivity within data centers. You know, uh, a lot of companies are looking to, you know, utilize better the backbones and, and provide those on-demand connectivity. but. For us as an operator in Latin America, you know, the the most critical part of interconnecting a client is the last mile. So, yeah, we're providing on-demand connectivity, but 90% of the time, you know, clients are asking for the last mile. So how do we provide the network as a service, including the last mile? You know, because that's a huge challenge, especially in Latin America. I'm sure everybody knows that Latin America is a nightmare, you know. 
every time you have an RFP with 50 sites in Latin America in different countries, you know, you're like, oh my God, you know, this is going <laughs> to take me two months, <laughs> just Latin America. So we have been working for four years on creating a platform that basically tackle that issue, not only the, the last mile, but also, you know, the whole customer experience, you know, because we have one of the lowest standards globally. So we created an algorithm that basically utilizes artificial intelligence, which is very, I was so click with what you were explaining mm -hmm. with artificial intelligence and because it's exactly the same practices that we're uh, using in Latin America, uh, embracing big data, uh, artificial intelligence, and then combining more than 157 different carriers, network data. So we're processing all the data where the fiber optic is going through and we're able to perform feasibility analysis for the last miles. So we're able to interconnect clients much faster, you know, uh, in a more quicker way. And then once you have that client active, then you can play with the bandwidth increase, you know, obviously once you get that building interconnected, you know, it takes a little bit of time, but once it is connected, then you can do the on-demand feature on the platform. So for us, it's been uh, definitely a deal, you know, uh, something huge for for the for the region but in terms of digital transformation we feel that the region is definitely very slow you know i believe the digital transformation has to come from the carrier side you know if we as carriers we don't digitally transform our business how can we help our clients digitally transform their business you know if we're taking two months to respond a, a quote you know most of the uh, assure uh aws you purchase those services with a click and you still have to go through emails to buy internet in Latin America and many in many other places too. So I feel that in, the, in terms of digital transformation, we're lacking in, in, in very aspects, you know, in a lot of the different aspects of the customer experience. So we have been concentrating on that aspect to make it very user friendly, very easy, you know, to tackle an RFP with a hundred sites where you can have that very easily done in, in, a, in a matter of a day. So uh, I believe that all carrier, we have a huge responsibility when we talk about digital transformation, but it doesn't matter if we're offering SASE and SD1 and all that, if we're still having so many, so many processes that are manual, you know, if we have bureaucracy within our business process, and then our customers are waiting two months for the services getting installed. So it has to come from the bottom up. And I feel we are at the bottom, you know, if we want, you know, the enterprises to digitally transform their business, we have to change ourselves too. And it's a big challenge because a lot of the, at least the Latin American carriers are so big, you know, we're talking about thousands of employees, you know, legacy systems that are so difficult to migrate to the cloud. You know, we are a small company for us. It's very easy to have all our applications in hyperscales and, and we can scale our business very easy, but you know, let's talk about a company that is an 80 year old company, you know, how do you transform that business and you put it on the on the new digital transformation era? It's a big challenge. So I believe that's where the concentration needs to be, at least in Latin America. And we're pretty much, you know, tackling that that issue from from the get go. OK, OK. If I can just connect to that, you know, oh, because yes, you were yes. talking a lot about Latin America and uh, I mean, it's the same in Europe. You know, when we talk about digital transformation, it's not finger pointing, you know, like a colleague will say, when you point to one person, four fingers point to yourself, you know? Mm. So th that's the point, you know, uh, of course, that the customer, they have the digital transformation, but also vendors or a carrier, everybody has a digital transformation. And we saw the timeline. And when we say, okay, we want to sell SD1, that's nice that you have the product, but how do you order it mm. at the end of the day? So that means also that you have to change your whole process, you know, yeah. as a carrier. So what I say is we're sitting all in the same boat about digital transformation, mm. right? So it's all the same, you know, and, and we together have to solve that, you know, and, and, and that's basically also one of your answers, right? Yeah. So network as a platform, it's nice, you know, or network as a service, but it means a lot of effort to develop such platforms where you can centrally do everything, mm. you know? Well, um, Please, I, jump, I, in, yeah, jump, jump in. Jump in here for a second. I was just thinking <coughs> it might be difficult. I don't want to offend you, but if you come from an old carrier, you didn't have a platform at the beginning. And again, I don't want to put ourselves in the spotlight, but there are some companies who were built from the ground onwards through a platform because platform was the basis, was the starting point. I think for these type of companies, it's a bit easier. 
and they have an easier adoption with these customers who are on the digital transformation. So to get to your point, there is always a manual intervention needed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never seen a box being installed by itself. I've never seen the last mile being installed by itself, 100%. But the more you can digitalize from checking, availability, pricing, I mean, that's what the platform is meant for. 100%. Yeah, but don't get me wrong, you know, so I, I don't talk about the solution, you know, when you talk uh, vendors like uh, Verza or whatever, they started a software company, you know, and they said, we program by ourselves, for example, right? And at the end, we have a nice software stack, but they never thought, for example, about, okay, how can somebody order it? That's not our uh, business, you know, and, and that's the point I, I want to say, you know, you have nice products, you know, but... Uh, this is also a part because the customer it wants a nice and neat and the best way a customer does not talk to you, to you, to you, to me, you know, because they go on a platform and just say, okay, I want this, 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 and this, that country. And they never talk to us. I mean, it's like uh, when you have a phone contract, right? You don't talk to a hotline, you just order it. Hmm. I, I have an interesting point to that because um, I think there's no black and white. Absolutely. Um, in, in my previous role, um, I've been with Rackspace. We have sold cloud. We, we were a reseller to all of the big hyperscalers, and we put our managed service on top of that. But the, the majority of the things we did is we educated procurement departments how cloud is consumed. So mm -hmm. they were still like asking, hey, in the past, we have ordered CPUs and data center, and we got that amount of discount. And I told them, okay, we can go to AWS and Azure and ask for discount, but they are flexible like an ambush, right? So it does not work. So what I mean is that in big enterprises, it will most likely not work from the beginning just to um, put something in the shopping cart online and procure it. It's not the way how big enterprises procure their services mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it has different aspects. So there is network as a service already there, like Branislav said, um, with vendors out there which have been built as software as a service or cloud native um, platforms. Um, but this is why it's, it's so important to have partnerships because it's not only like we provide as um, Cato a SASE service, but what if the customer doesn't have the underlay today so they need to have that as well so there comes partnerships in play which are very important and then those kind of buying um uh, process needs to be integrated as well right mm -hmm. so it's not that easy Roy, you want to jump in yeah i was going to say i think that the panel's pointing out a very critical thing that's that's a little different you know cloud computing or cloud storage than connectivity which is that there is a presupposition that you already have connectivity and you know, if you don't have a connectivity, <laughs> well, you know, you can as a service all you want, but all you get is AS, right? It's just AAS, right? I mean, so so I think that there is that, that key element, but but we do see network as a service coming out on the data center side, especially with clouds, because the backbones in fact are there, right? I mean, the subsea cables are there. So for those things, I think we want to differentiate sort of connectivity from network, right? Which is that. In those situations, connectivity exists. Doesn't mean you have NAS, right? Doesn't mean that the software layers that you can provision, you can set your QoS, you can purchase on demand. I think that NAS portion, as opposed to the connect pure connectivity, I think that does start to exist on the data center side. On the last mile, that's always a challenge, right? If you don't have fiber to your home, you don't have fiber to your home. You can try to connect it all you want, uh, but I think that connectivity first as a service um there's a procurement elements right there's a automation element there's a distributed you know, how do i get other people in the ecosystem to turn on that element but then once you have that i think we need to focus on the next part which is how do you build a software stacks how do you consume how do you purchase how do you decide what slas make sense in what part of the network and that's the nas portion of it so i think we we do as we go forward in conversation differentiate just raw connectivity from the intelligent level of networking, right? Which is that NAS portion. Okay, thank you, Roy. So let's. Let, what I'm interesting in what are actually the the, the uh, key technologies underpinning actually the network transformation? Who wants it? Who wants it? I mean, I mean uh, I've, I've, you, I've talked a lot about it already. SD one. I mean, Sassy, what is it, 5G, satellite, what are the keys, what are the, 
the I key elements there. What the gentleman just said, I mean, you can network, network as a service as you want. If you don't have the underlay, if you don't have the connectivity as such, mm -hmm. I think that's that's the bare minimum, right? That's the bare minimum. And there you need to have the platform that's ready to support whatever, whatever. is coming. Is it 5G tomorrow? Is it satellite? Is it Mr. Elon Musk's satellites, which are doing what they have to do? I mean, it needs to be an agnostic platform, which is easy to plug in new services. Okay. That's our belief. Let me move on then. From, me, from, yeah, please. From, from our end, I, I believe the customer is, is the main driver. Mm -hmm. You know, in Latin America, uh, customers are, you know, you're talking about companies that have presence in Europe, in the US, and then they have branches in Latin America. So mm -hmm. they need to get aligned with the rest of the, the, the their operations globally. And they're, they're driving that uh, adoption locally. And then you get that challenge of, yeah, I may have interconnection, but I don't have the right interconnection for the digital transformation that I'm looking for. You know, the cloud connectivity, you know, how can I have a better latency to the different hyperscalers through the region? You know, we're talking about a region that is probably 10 years behind the rest of the world. So it's, but at the same time, it's like trying to keep pace, you know, trying to breathe, you know, but the water keeps going up, you know, and, uh, 90% of the clients, they need that connectivity to the to the customer premise. Mm -hmm. It's not about the data center. You know, we're seeing the issue from our side and we're trying to uh, go the easy way around. It's about the customer side. If we don't think about uh, enable the client to scale quickly from the customer premise, you know, we keep doing the same thing that we were doing three years ago. We have yeah. to change the mindset. You know, it's about the customer premise. We have to automate the last miles. If we don't automate the last miles, we're going to keep doing the same thing all over again. So that's what we're working on in Latin America. So far, we have 50 million on net buildings automated. Mm -hmm. you know, that means that we can sell a service in 50 million on net buildings in Latin America without having any interaction with us. You know, that's all artificial intelligence, big data, you know, uh, 20 years of quoting data. You know, but but that has to be, you know, we have to go from bottom up, at least in Latin America. You know, I know you guys are from different regions, Europe, you know, it's different time frames and different mm -hmm. advantage from different regions. But but in Latin America, we're tackling that issue and we're trying to, you know, push, you know, the automation wave in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hang, you want to bump in? Yeah. yeah, you're cool with it? I'm cool with it. All right. <laughs> um, we already, I mean, you said the next big thing is AI, right? It is, it is AI. And um, I mean, AI and machine learning are the, okay, the essential tools for, for the, for the, for the next, uh, next generation networks. So um, Roy, from, from your point of view, what, what, what can you share with us? What, what, what are your thoughts about, uh, about AI? Yeah, I think I think the the AI and ML, I think, are, are critical. I mean, machine learning part of AI is critical in terms of the the management of the network, right? And orchestration of the network. I think that that's very clear given the scale that we have with five G, or just the sheer scale of networking going forward. As as you know, we de depicted an example, and that Hein was pointing out. You know, in terms, it, you you need something like AI and ML to make sure that the networks stay operational, um, and you need AI and ML in some cases to help you with designing and provisioning networks. So I think those you know, AI and ML are critical. Um, the work that we have seen with some of the tier one providers uh, and some of the new AI ML startups or companies um, is quite promising. I mean, you, you see sort of times of resolution drop dramatically. You see the number of use cases that the AI and ML can recognize so that they, they have these patterns, like, you know, there's 78 failure patterns that AI and ML can recognize and that keeps growing and, and going up. So. I think AI ML is pretty promising. Um, I think the the training data set is in progress. Um, it's not perfect yet, but some of the early results, I mean, again, these are AI ML vendors, so I gotta be careful, right? They're showing me the best examples of why the tools work the best across large networks, right? There's a little, probably, there's maybe 90% of those maybe don't work and they're showing me the 10%, it's possible, but at least the ones that I'm seeing, the examples I'm seeing, and what the carriers are actually telling me, in fact, are that those tools are working from a design automation standpoint, they are helping. From a troubleshooting root cause analysis standpoint, they are helping. From an auto remediation standpoint, uh, it's in, progr in progress, they're being allowed to help. 
but it is important, I think, as a fundamental element in terms of managing the sheer scale of what's being asked for, that AI ML is in fact critical. And it is showing up more and more as, as, we are, as we're seeing and working with the different carriers. Mm -hmm. Okay, gentlemen, who wants to bump in? Yeah, I just want to add uh, something. So it's very nice uh, what you said, you know. Um, I, I was talking also to, to some guys of, from Cisco, you know, who were also doing um, AI stuff. And what they said, it was very interesting. They said, listen, we have our own data of networks from the past 20 years, basically, you know, sitting around and we can just apply it on that to see what happens, you know. And we have application of um, ML and AI in different regions beside networks, for example, like predictive maintenance, right? Mm -hmm. You have it in trains, you have it in uh, in factories, whatever. The same algorithms, and, and it's only about that. So when do I know that a device will break down? It's the same question like, when will my, my network break down, right? So on these things, you can use this algorithm and, and specify them even better to know when will my CPE break down, when do my Wi-Fi break down or whatever, you know, such things are very helpful. Again, you know, uh, you have a lot of data and um, there are also mechanisms where you can, um, let's say, do the reconfiguration of your network with the help of AI because the algorithms, you know, mm -hmm. they adjust everything, you know, reconfigure it because what is the usual thing when you have a blackout you know people race go to the machine and start searching for the error you know it's better than that the machine is there taking over you know and just sending you a message okay i've done something go come to the machine and take a look at it whether it's okay right and if it's okay go on working you know and resolve then let's for example say the blackout of the machine or whatever right but that frightens some people that's okay but the question is um how smart is your job? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, my job is not the same I was doing 10 years ago, you know, and that's normal. My, my private <laughs> life is not the same like it was 10 or 15 years ago, right? So life changes and, and that's for sure a thing about change management. And the thing is, I mean, look what you get, not what you lose. You get the most smartest technology on earth, which you can form and shape for your own sake. And that's awesome. That's marvelous, you know? Instead of saying, no, I don't want it. And on the control side? It's also good, you know, because, you know, when I was in IT and software development, there was a project manager, he said something very smart. He said, computers are there to take idiotic tasks that the human being does not do it, you know, because that's the, the way our machine does something. So why should we as human beings do stupid things? Let's do the smart things. You know, it's, I said, it's mimicking the human mm. behavior. It's not being a human. So a human and, and an AI is a large difference. Mm. You know, one of, one of the things that we're doing, the, the platform has a monitoring section and it basically through AI, we detect abnormal behavior in the traffic. Mm -hmm. So every time we, well, not we, the, the, the technology recognizes abnormal behavior in the traffic, it sets an alarm and many times we're able to identify uh, human error configuration, mal hardware malfunctioning, and those are the advantages of history of data. You know, it's basically what you were addressing dur during your presentation that you have so many data that, that is sitting somewhere, you know, that now is being used to predict things, you know, to help the clients make better decisions, you know, address issues before they become a reality. So it's the different ways, useful ways without, you know, getting into the scary things of AI, you know, because it's, it's getting concerning, you know, the, the, the level of AI. The questions you know, are there. Are, the questions are out there. Yeah. And, and some are good. legit and some yeah. not. And I yes. think it's, it's, it's our task to educate the people of, mm -hmm. hey, guys, th th this is the line. But, exactly. I mean. Yeah, we do traffic behavior. You mm -hmm. know, we don't, we don't get involved in the data, obviously, because of privacy, but but we're, we're using the technology for something, you know, that is definitely providing a better experience in Latin America. You know, we're, again, we're tackling so, so many different aspects or, or experiences that you didn't have before in Latin America. Mm -hmm. So, you know, AI is definitely a huge tool for different aspects of the business. In terms of monitoring, you know, you can definitely prevent issues before they, they become a reality. Mm -hmm. And if I just may add a propaganda bomb, you know, at the end, it's about costs, you know. So what, what you can do with AI is also when you analyze the traffic to see, oh, you have a 500 mag line. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you don't need it. You need just 100. Mm. 
let's you know down select it to 100 and that's okay you save money and vice versa you, know, you vice have versa. problems yeah. you know you have problems somewhere and without doing anything the system tells you oh your 500 man line is full mm -hmm. you should need yeah. more you know and then we're at the flexible time again you know Right. Okay. I, I, I would agree. So yeah. it's about the purpose of AI and ML, right? So um, yeah. we as Europeans, we would be most likely scared how it's um, <laughs> used in, in um, China, for example, with the scoring system. And if you cross a traffic um, sign and it's red, then you get some points and stuff like that. Um, we would be scared about that. But um, as Branislav said, if it will bring business value and um, it improve your resilience, your security, this is... Um, from my perspective, not questioned anymore, because we as a vendor, so not speaking about um, a, from a carrier perspective, but as a vendor, we have 1,300 enterprise customers on our platform. Mm -hmm. They do not question um, whether we use AI or ML. It's, yeah, it, it's standard for us to use that in order to have our backbone um, in a way that is self-healing, it's resilient. We can have that kind of um, SLAs which we provide, right? So I think it's always a question about the purpose of mm -hmm. the IMMR. Hey, you no. want to add something? That's covered. <laughs> Completely covered. No, I mean, the one thing I just want to say is um, this type of AI to, to, to manage a network, to monitor a network, root cost, what is it? Should be with us. Definitely not with the, with the enterprise. Definitely mm -hmm. not. Should be with us. All the intelligence, the, the pre, pre work that has to be done should be with us. The only concern for the end user is how does my application perform, and especially my business credit application. But also transparency, you know. Yes, yeah, full that's transparency. Sure. And that's about yeah, surely. Roy. Roy. Yeah, I was going to say it's. I think the one thing that I think as carriers is it's important to understand how to manage AI, use AI. Um, there's a whole thing around sort of model ops, right? How do you manage AI models, and to recognize that as time goes on, you know, the data that you train it on has to be retrained, right? There's model drift, which is that the patterns change over time. If you use 20 years of data before, this doesn't mean that 20 years is useful anymore, right? Because the traffic pattern changes, things change. And I think uh, as carriers to make sure that you're offering the best in class service is that the team members within the carriers, you have to hire the right you know, data scientists, the right AI folks, or at least work with vendors that have that technology knowledge to keep yourself updated because it's not a magic bullet. I mean, AI is not magic. You don't say, you know, just put it in and it works. There's mm -hmm. a lot of understanding and data analysis, data cleaning, you know, bias removal, or at least bias awareness in the data um, within AI. And I think just the management of that, I think that understanding is critical. And that's one thing I, I have an older son who's actually a network engineer. He uses, you know, Cisco equipment, Juniper equipment. He's like, yeah, this marvelous thing is great. This AI stuff is great. But, you know, when would the AI tell me that the next version of iOS I load on my CPE is going to break it, right? It doesn't help me because, <laughs> you know, yeah, right? I mean, so, yeah, you can predict all that, but you can't tell me yeah. that when I put a new release, you know, the router stops working, right? Because the, you know, so it's like when that happens, then I trust AI, right? But anyway, that's that's a sort of funny story that he was telling about AI. Yeah. If, I, if I just may add one thing, because uh, Andreas mentioned it also with, with China. That, that's also a reason, you know, why, why companies, large companies like Dutch Telecom. So it's not advertisement. Advertisement. It's just about you know being an example. Uh, even three or four years ago, stated you know ethical AI. They said, okay, whenever we as a company do something, we want full transparency that nobody is scared, you know, which is super important. Just, you know, I, I understand you, you know, that you have a nice user experience, but I think at the end, you know, about AI that we do not have, you know, people who are scared about it, that you have transparency saying, okay, that's how it works, you know, just that you know that you're not afraid, you know, so it's just for your convenience, right? Okay. Let me see if there's, there's a question from the audience. Yes. Nasia. Is it then fair to say, gentlemen, that AI is not really the next best thing because it's already there, it's happening, it's an enabler. So my question, it comes down to what is truly the next best thing when it comes to network as a service? Because an AI is enabling us to provide the services, right? So it's an enabler. So what's the next thing that us as a user I'm looking forward to get from the network operators. Did you read my notes? <laughs> <laughs> so, Not yet. Please, Chris. maybe from my perspective. So I think the, the next big, big thing, and this not only is relevant for, for this area which we're talking about, it's in general, it's co-creation. Because I see many digital transformation initiatives 
not moving fast enough. If, if you look like um, German companies, they are also not usually the early adopters. So there are other regions. We know. So, uh, so it's, know. About, <laughs> it's about the right mindset from the people that it's not anymore um, one um, uh, company is doing everything. Um, it's a co-creation, right? And um, the co-creation could be at one point um, we are working together with Telecom. The next um, thing is Telecom is working together with another vendor, right? So it always needs to fit for purpose for the customer. Um, but the, the key for me is really the co-creation part. Okay, let, let, let me broaden it a little bit. And maybe, gentlemen, as, as, a, as a closing statement, we can use this as well. Um, uh, combining the, the nice question from, from Nasia, and thank you for your question, Nasia. Um, uh, it's also not only the next big thing, but also a little bit in the future, what will we see if it's a big thing or a, a small thing? So, please. I think, you know, just um, to answer your question, for me personally, um, the whole network is just too complex and user unfriendly. So we have to become more user friendly in the sense like we yesterday I heard it from Phil, the company and the customers, they want to decide by their own, but they can't know that because you're basically hiding information uh, and that's not good. So my dream is like in a car. I mean, I don't think that, uh, you know, network is more complex than, you know, screen to a car. The customer doesn't uh, is not interested in the screw you use, you know. The customer is interested in the, in the color and the alloys and whatever, and that's the same with the network. You have your sites, you want to click them, you want to have this and that, I want here to have the internet there, I want here to have the first mile there, this, this is the underlay, blah, blah, blah. And you just click that and you say order when you see the price and directly, you see directly, instantaneously. So order it in one day, you know, and getting it in 10 days later, mm -hmm. you know. That's my dream, my personal made me yes. dream, and there we should go. Mm -hmm. Happy days. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I believe productivity is, is, is the, the center of everything because it's not only about the clients, it's also about the, our own organizations, you know. Uh, one of our, the studies that, that we did, not only in our, in our company, but also the, the Latin American region, uh, salespeople, engineers, pricing specialists, they spend at least 48% of their time working on CRMs. 48% mm. of the time mm. on CRMs. So if we automate, you know, as much as we can, you know, obviously, like you were saying, you know, that there is a limit, but if we try to automate as much as we can now, you know, you don't have people working on feasibility analysis, you know, if we can deliver a service in a particular location that should be automated. You know, there's so many business processes that should be automated in organization like ours. So by the time, you know, you, you, you see the productivity of not only the clients, but also ours, we can support better the clients and then the clients can go to market much faster. So it's, in, in my perspective in Latin America, clients are begging for a better experience. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's the same in, in other regions, but, yes, yes, yes. but <laughs> I, I believe us carrier, we have a lot of work to do, you know, moving forward with a clear vision of a better customer experience. And we're very much behind on that aspect. Thank you, Roy. Your closing statement, what should we yeah. look out for? What's the next big thing? Come so on. I think, I think the, the network's not quite there yet. I think I, I, I go back to the beginning of cloud computing and I was, you know, in an organization and we had a bunch of engineers and we were running things. Along this came this thing called EC2, um, you know, and mm -hmm. back then, right? And all of a sudden I was like, wait, what does this mean? I can take a credit card and swipe it and you put it in. And my engineers can go in there and consume cloud services, right? And then they started using it and they saw EC2, Elastic Compute 2, APIs, right? That's Amazon, AWS. You know, and then there was this S3 interface for storage. And they're like, oh, that's pretty cool. We're not there with the network yet, right? I think what we're missing still is we don't have a standard network model that sort of you look at it, it's like, oh, that makes sense. We don't have a standard API model that we can consume and say, that makes sense. And we don't have the pricing model that says, I swipe the card and I pay, you know, nine cents an hour, or whatever it is, for whatever unit that makes sense, right? We kind of have it close, we're not there. And I think the aha moment for me will be when <clears throat> someone application developer, right, on the team says, yeah, I'm gonna consume this NAS thing that we call, and there is a model that I understand, there is an API I understand, and it's a pricing or business model that goes with it that, that I, I like. And the combination of that, I think, unlock AWS and cloud computing 
that combination is supposed to unlock for us NAS as well. And we're not quite there yet. I think the next step is when that unlocks, you are like, ah, you know, of course it makes sense. Now I can program the network the same way I program storage, the same way I use computing. And we're trying to get there. I think in the next couple of years, I think it will happen. And once that unlocks, we truly have NAS, right? So that I'm waiting for that moment. Okay, okay. So last famous words from famous uh, words. from you, Hang. I just want to wrap up what everybody said, and uh, it's pretty much the same. It's the end user experience. Get to that point. Make that as a, the focal point. And what's underneath? They actually shouldn't care. Yes, full transparency. Yes, as automated as possible. Yes, as slider friendly as possible. <laughs> but in the end, there's always some manual intervention. Let's make it uh, as transparent as good just for the end user experience. Okay, we, fantastic. And ladies and gentlemen, we were talking today on uh, network as a platform and rethinking actually, uh, the, not so much the business models, but actually we, we went a, a bit more into the network. And, uh, and I really liked it. And with, uh, with that, I would like to thank you. Roy, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's You're late, you can go to bed now. Thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. Now, now I can have sweet dreams. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll dream of network as a platform. I'm gonna take a nap, how's that? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you so you. much. And thank you, audience. And thank you for your questions. Thank you so much.